Hi everyone, this is Dan Clanton, and this is our mini-lecture, Destruction, Exile, and Jeremiah. Unlike our previous mini-lectures, we're going to delve into a much more thorough discussion of the historical background and context of the events and the literature that we're discussing in the lecture. After the Battle of Carchemish in 605, the Judean king Jehoiakim was forced to pay tribute to Babylon. However, after three or four years and a failed attempt by the ruler of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, to take over Egypt in 601, Jehoiakim returned to his pro-Egyptian policy and stopped paying Nebuchadnezzar tribute in about 600. Nebuchadnezzar responded to this act by sending troops to besiege Jerusalem. Jehoiakim had died during the siege, but his son Jehoiakim was ruling. Faced with confronting the Babylonians, he did the only thing he could. He surrendered unconditionally to Nebuchadnezzar. After this surrender, Jehoiakim was deposed as king and deported to Babylon as a prisoner after only three months in office. Nebuchadnezzar then appointed his own king, a son of Josiah named Madaniah, whom Nebuchadnezzar then renamed Zedekiah, and who ruled for 11 years. Judah was reeling from the surrender of Jehoiakim because Nebuchadnezzar took all the treasures from both the temple and the palace to Babylon. At this time, there was also a deportation of the leading classes of Judah to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar probably hoped that by this action, any future revolutionaries would think twice before they tried something with him. As Bernhard Anderson notes, because of the deportations and economic hardships, quote, the nation was crippled at the very time when the need for resourceful leadership and stable traditions was greatest. Into this vacuum moved a new nobility, ill-equipped for the heavy responsibilities of the hour and even less capable of perceiving the religious meaning of the crisis. Governed by a short-sighted nationalism, and swayed by the emotional appeal of prophetic demagogues, these new leaders hastened the downfall of the nation. Also, this new nobility was, quote, pro-Egyptian, and saw in Pharaoh Necho, or in his successor, Semeticus II, the political potential that might restore a balance of power to the Fertile Crescent and allow Judah and other small nations to regain independence. End quote. Because of these pro-Egyptian feelings, Anderson writes, quote, It is not surprising that in the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign, 594, the year of the accession of Semeticus II, Egyptian agents encouraged the formation of an anti-Babylonian coalition consisting of Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Phoenicia. Envoys were sent to Zedekiah to persuade him to throw in his lot with the revolutionary movement, end quote. For whatever reasons, perhaps Jeremiah's vehement condemnation, Zedekiah did not join this conspiracy in 594. However, the political scene changed in 588. A new Egyptian monarch assumed power named Apris, also called Hophra in Jeremiah 44. Hophra's predecessor was content to merely incite revolution, but Hophra wasn't so content. He organized an expedition into Asia to challenge the Babylonian Empire. Quote, This turn of events gave new hope to the nations that were chafing under the Babylonian yoke. Revolution broke out anew, and this time the centers of the revolt were Ammon and Judah. We're told in Ezekiel chapter 21 that Nebuchadnezzar resorts to divination to decide who to attack, and the lot falls on Jerusalem. Thus, in 588, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem again. Evidently, these revolutionaries were counting on Egyptian aid, just like the Israelite king, Hoshea, was counting on Egypt before Assyria squashed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, and in both cases, the aid never came. By itself, Judah was too small to have any effect on Babylon, 
Zedekiah was captured, trying to escape from the city, and taken to Nebuchadnezzar, where his sons were killed before his eyes, which were then put out, and in the end he was led in chains to exile in Babylon. This act against Zedekiah sealed the fate of Jerusalem. As 2 Kings chapter 25 verse 9 tells us, Nebuchadnezzar, quote, burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. Put differently, quote, the city was taken, its walls were destroyed, and the palace and temple were razed to the ground, end quote. Following this, another deportation was conducted, and Judah, like her northern neighbor after 722, ceased to exist as an independent entity. As you can see, this chart delineates the specific deportations that Nebuchadnezzar conducted against the upper class of Judah. This map demonstrates for you the extent to which Nebuchadnezzar increased the borders and the land holdings of the Neo-Babylonian Empire in the time we're discussing. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, after the destruction of Jerusalem and the subsequent defeat of Judah, another deportation was conducted by the Babylonians. In his text, H. Yagersma notes two characteristics of Babylonian deportations which differed from the kinds of deportations that the Assyrian Empire imposed upon the northern kingdom of Israel in the late 8th century, which allowed a modicum of religious freedom in exile. First, the Babylonians did not introduce other ethnic groups into Judah to replace those who were deported. This meant that the danger of syncretism in religion was less acute. And second, the Babylonians again differed from the Assyrians in that evidently they settled most of the deported Jews in the same area in Babylon. And this obviously allowed for some religious practices and freedoms to be maintained. The Babylonians evidently felt that they could help their captives be happy, productive members of the empire by settling them all together in what we can think of as the first ghetto in Jewish history. This decision proved to be absolutely essential in the development and preservation of the biblical traditions and stories found among those in exile. That is, only because they were settled together were the exiles capable of preserving and collecting and editing together the stories, some written, some oral, that they brought with them to Babylon when they were exiled. After all, most scholars believe that it was during the exile that most of the Pentateuch as we now have it was edited together. The literature produced during the Babylonian exile is a response to what historian John Bright calls a quote-unquote theological emergency. That is, Judah and Jerusalem had been sacked by the Babylonians. The Temple of Solomon was destroyed, and the upper-class literate population had endured wave after wave of deportation to Babylon. There would have been numerous obvious, serious theological questions after these events, such as, how do we worship God now that the temple has been destroyed? Where will we be able to make the sacrifices that will enact our repentance and lead to God's blessings? Since God promised our ancestors the land we just lost in the covenant, does that mean God's word is not constant? Has God reneged on the covenant? Since we were defeated by Babylon, does that mean that the Babylonian gods are mightier than our god? Perhaps the most profound statement of this theological emergency can be found in Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6, which reads, quote, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. 
for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying to us, Sing us a song of Zion. But how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Let's switch gears now to examine one piece of exilic literature, the book of Jeremiah. The dates for Jeremiah's activities are usually taken to be about 626 to 587. As you know from the earlier part of our lecture, the major events of that time include Josiah's second religious reform, the installation of Jehoiakim as an Egyptian puppet king, the power and influence of the Babylonian Empire, felt first at the Battle of Carchemish in 605, the first siege of Jerusalem and the second deportation by Nebuchadnezzar in around 598, the rise of Egyptian power as evidenced by an attempted revolutionary coalition in 594, and a full-scale revolt against Babylon in 588, after which Jerusalem was besieged yet again by Nebuchadnezzar. This time, as we've seen, the city was taken, the temple was destroyed, and another deportation was conducted. All of these events form the background to the book of Jeremiah. When we turn to the person of Jeremiah, we must admit that, like many prophetic figures, we simply don't know as much as we would like to about Jeremiah, the historical person. So as with other prophetic texts, it's helpful to discuss the superscription of the book, which says, quote, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, son of Ammon of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. End quote. Based on this, we know that Jeremiah came from Anatoth, which was a suburb of sorts outside of Jerusalem. We also know that his father Hilkiah was a priest, so supposedly he would have been a priest as well. Throughout the book, Jeremiah is pictured as working in and around. Much more often, Jeremiah plays the role of the quintessential prophet. He speaks for the Lord uses common prophetic speech forms like oracles and woes, performs symbolic actions that often have metaphoric or analogous overtones, has visions and reports them, speaks against foreign nations, and at one and the same time announces the impending destruction of the land by Nebuchadnezzar and announces a new covenant built on inward manifestations of holiness, not outward signs. Because of these actions, Jeremiah's primary role is that of a prophet. And in the final analysis, that piece of information may be the most important for us to know. Turning to the book of Jeremiah, we have to note from the outset that there are at least two different major editions of the book of Jeremiah. One is the Hebrew version also known as the MT, or the Masoretic Text, and the other is the Greek version, also known as the Septuagint Text, usually referred to by the symbol LXX for 70. This Greek version is obviously different than the Hebrew, being about one-seventh length shorter, and even rearranging some of the oracles. Understanding the relationship between the two versions is difficult, but Robert Carroll's position represents the mainstream. He writes, quote, The Greek version may represent the translation into Greek of an earlier version of Jeremiah than the present Hebrew text. This earlier Hebrew text may either be lost or now incorporated into the expanded Hebrew version. The longer Hebrew text is probably best regarded as constituting a second 
or expanded edition of the Vorlage, that is the underlying or parent text, behind the Greek translation. Because of this difference, as well as the obvious composite nature of the text, establishing a structure for the book of Jeremiah isn't easy. However, the structure that we will adopt for our purposes, provided by Robert Carroll, does justice to the complexity of the book. Within each section, I'll examine several specific texts from Jeremiah in an attempt not only to familiarize you with its content, but also to help us try and understand Jeremiah's response to the theological emergency of the exile. We'll begin with the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 to 19, which includes the call narrative of Jeremiah in chapter 1, verses 4 to 19. The call narrative is congruent with previous call narratives we've examined, including those in Exodus 3, 1 Samuel 3, and the sixth chapter of Isaiah. That is, it follows the standard format of a call narrative in that a. God commissions Jeremiah, b. Jeremiah refuses the call, and c. God then reassures Jeremiah via a sign here found in chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. Following this commission, Jeremiah has two visions in verses 11 to 12 and 13 to 19, and reports their contents just as we saw in Amos's visions. There are two inter interesting points about the second vision in chapter 1, verses 13 to 19. First, it appears that God will use Babylon to punish the disobedient people, just as we saw God use Assyria in the 8th century material in Isaiah. Jeremiah even calls Nebuchadnezzar the servant of God later on in chapter 27, verse 6. Second, there's an irony in chapter 1, verse 18, in that while Jeremiah is told that the city of Jerusalem will certainly fall, God makes him a city that won't fall. Sounds a little like 2 Samuel, chapter 7. Part 1 of the book, chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 25, verse 14, poems and sermons against Judah and Jerusalem. Also included here are Jeremiah's six personal laments, or his confessions, of which we'll mention the fifth and sixth in a moment. First, the early oracles in chapters 2 and 3. We find two main themes therein. First, the scandal and the uselessness of Israel's worship of foreign gods, which should sound familiar. And second, the scandal and uselessness of seeking political help from Egypt and Assyria. When we turn to the second example from the second section of Jeremiah, we encounter a remarkable chapter, 7, the Temple Sermon of Jeremiah. We've already seen both Amos and Isaiah critique the tendency to engage in outward ritual observance in the religious cult without the proper interior theological orientation. Jeremiah, too, makes this critique, but he stands in the gate of the temple to do so. In his portrait of Jeremiah, the Jewish author Eli Wiesel discusses the problem with the temple which Jeremiah points out as well as his solution. Wiesel writes, quote, True, the temple exists and is open for services, but read Jeremiah or Isaiah, and the holy sanctuary seems something of a club. People go there to meet one another and discuss politics, or to require a good conscience at a reasonable price. Prayers are too bothersome. A few well-chosen offerings and all problems are solved. Who cares what one does and with whom, since it is possible to erase everything and start all over again? It is up to the prophet to stop the process by forcing them to remember the covenant the law, the promise of the beginning, the moral thrust of Israel's adventure. 
To forget means to deny the relevance of the past. To forget the beginning means to justify the end, the end of Israel. Thus, Jeremiah's magnificently rendered prophetic discourse is contrapuntal in structure and concept. Set in the present, it reaches out simultaneously to the distant past and the unattainable future and makes one dependent on the other. But, while Jeremiah performs brilliantly, the audience is not with him. Third example, the allegory of the potter in chapter 11. This section, in which God tells Jeremiah to observe a potter whose vessel gets ruined and who must begin again, not only echoes the vision reports we saw in chapter 1 and in the book of Amos, but also contains some very clear dependence on the Deuteronomistic history, especially in verses 7 to 10. Example 4, the fifth and sixth personal laments or confessions of Jeremiah. A peculiar aspect of the book of Jeremiah is the presence of six poems written in the first person in which Jeremiah keens and laments over his prophetic vocation and the negative personal repercussions he's experienced. In chapter 20, verses 7 to 13, Jeremiah accuses God of exerting an irresistible influence over him. There is no divine response here, unlike the first two laments. And many scholars have commented that the images of rape and quote-unquote fire in the bones are particularly disturbing here, in that they remove all personal choice from the prophet's activity. The description of God as someone who seduces and forces Jeremiah to act against his own self-interests is an uncomfortable one, to say the least. Because he is forced to prophesy, Jeremiah curses his own existence in 20 verses 14 to 18, noting that he wishes someone had aborted him in his mother's womb in chapter 20 verse 17. However we are to understand the language and imagery in these sections, it seems certain that Jeremiah's laments introduce something new into biblical literature. As Bruce C. Birch et al. note in their text, a theological introduction to the Old Testament, quote, It is not at all clear what to make of these prayers. Even as their wording and form are relatively clear, the intent purpose, and function of them in the book of Jeremiah is not obvious. It may be, as has been commonly assumed, that they are the cries of a faithful servant of the Lord who enjoys intense access to the Lord, daring to speak intimately to the Lord about the risks and costs of faithfulness. It has been alternatively suggested that these prayers, though presented as personal prayers in their present form and location, are the voice of jeopardized Israel, now seeking the support and advocacy of the Lord in a circumstance of acute danger. Interpretation is not easy. It may be enough, provisionally, to see that these prayers introduce into the tradition of Jeremiah a dimension of pathos, hurt, anger, and need. That is, the force of Jeremiah cannot be reduced to a conventional theology of blessing and curse. The human reality vis-a-vis -vis the Lord in a dangerous world of real politique is much more ragged and unsettled than that." End quote. Moving on to the third section of the book, Part 2, Oracles Against the Nations, Part 3, Chapters 26 through 36, interests us much more. In this section, we find miscellaneous narratives and cycles, including large sections 
from the memoirs of Jeremiah's scribe Baruch. And let us again look at several examples of texts from this particular section. Part 3, Example 1, the Second Temple Sermon in Chapter 26, delivered in 609. Now, this is virtually the same critique that we saw in Chapter 7, but there are two additional points to make here. First, in Chapter 26, Verse 13, we again see the influence of the Deuteronomistic history in the endorsement of two ways theology, which was also present in chapter 7, verses 23 to 24. And second, it's important to recognize the influence of chapters 7 and 26 on the activity of Jesus, who not only imitates Jeremiah's temple sermons in Mark, chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, but Jesus also quotes directly from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, therein. Our second example from this section is the symbolic action of the yoke in Jeremiah chapter 27. Here, Jeremiah puts on a yoke to symbolize the fate of, quote, any nation or kingdom who will not serve this king this king being Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah, as I mentioned earlier, also refers to Nebuchadnezzar as a servant of God here in chapter 27, verse 6, very similar to the way in which Isaiah chapter 10 refers to Assyria and Cyrus the Great of the Persian Empire is referred to in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Both of these actions, the putting on of a yoke to praise Nebuchadnezzar and referring to Nebuchadnezzar as a servant of God, both of these actions would have obviously been seen as treasonous. The third example, the assertion of Nebuchadnezzar as a servant of God and his actions with the yoke lead directly to the prophetic confrontation with Hananiah in chapter 28, in which Hananiah prophesies the exact opposite message that Jeremiah did, even going so far as to break the yoke around Jeremiah's neck in chapter 28, verse 10. Now, things don't end well with Hananiah, as Jeremiah's prophecy of his death in chapter 28, verses 15 to 16, comes true fairly quickly. Example 4, Jeremiah's letters to the exiles in chapter 29. As if Jeremiah's treasonous talk in chapter 27 wasn't enough, in chapter 29, he sends a letter to those Judeans already in exile in Babylon, and in verses 5 to 7, advises them to, quote, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In other words, while the exiles were probably expecting a message of immediate release or homecoming, Jeremiah tells them to get comfortable and be good to Babylon, because, as he notes in 29 verse 10, the exile is going to last 70 years. Ironically, the deportees wound up taking Jeremiah's advice as the Jewish community in Babylon lasted for centuries. In fact, when Cyrus the Great of the Persian Empire defeated Babylon and told the exiles they could return home, the majority of them remained behind. Our fifth and final example, the Book of Consolation, chapters 30 to 31, with its twin themes of homecoming and the New Covenant the Book of Consolation 
is one of the most theologically important sections in Jeremiah. As you are probably aware, Jeremiah is not known for his hopeful, optimistic, unicorn, rainbow prophecies, but in chapters 30 to 31, he reassures the exiles that God will not only bring them home, God will forgive them. Part of that forgiveness will be the establishment of a new covenant, about which we'll talk more in just a few minutes. For now, let me just note how influential this new covenant imagery has been in New Testament literature and Christian history. When some followers of Jesus decided they'd moved away from their Jewish roots sufficiently, it was this imagery and language they used in order to differentiate themselves from other forms of Judaism in the first century. More specifically, the author of the book of Hebrews uses not just the imagery of the new covenant, but also quotes Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, in its entirety, in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, in order to argue that the covenant made with Jesus is better than the covenant with Moses, and as such, the covenant with Moses is now obsolete. The final two pieces of Jeremiah are composed of Part 4, chapters 37 to 45, the fall of Jerusalem and its aftermath, and a brief epilogue in chapter 52. As I said earlier, Jeremiah at one and the same time announces the impending destruction of the land by Nebuchadnezzar and announces a new covenant built on inward manifestations of holiness, not outward signs. A good example of the former is found in chapter 16, verses 10 to 13, which reads, quote, And when you tell this people all these words, and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our iniquity? What is the sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, It is because your ancestors have forsaken me, and have gone after other gods, and have served and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, and because you have behaved worse than your ancestors. For here you are, every one of you, following your stubborn evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore I will hurl you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your ancestors have known, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. Put differently, because of the failure of both Josiah's reforms and Deuteronomic theology, the people have once again returned to their former ways of syncretistic religious practices. The Lord sees this behavior and decides to put an end to the people. But this won't be any type of decisive action on the part of God. As Anderson notes, quote, The wrath of God is not so much God's intervention to punish as it is a withdrawal from a rebellious people, leaving them to suffer the destructive consequences of their own actions and attitudes. Thus the Lord will simply allow the people to fall into the hands of the invading Babylonians rather than save a rebellious people once more. The expression of the new covenant is found in chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, which reads, quote, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. In his text, Anderson notes six aspects of this new covenant that deserve our attention. First, this new covenant, quote, will rest upon the initiative and authority of God. Israel's faith will be a response to what God has done, not a bilateral bargain between equal partners. Second, this covenant will be distinct from the Mosaic covenant, quote, for the history of the people had shown that to be a broken covenant. Third, the new covenant will, quote, fulfill the original intention of the Sinai covenant, end quote. The meaning of that covenant has been eroded and eclipsed by outward signs of false piety, like religious ceremonies and written laws, but, quote, in the new covenant, however, the Torah will be written upon the heart. Fourth, quote, the new covenant will bring into being a new community, the Lord's people. Because the Lord will bring about a change of human nature by giving a new heart or will, there will be a permanent harmony between Israel's will and the Lord's will. Indeed, no longer will it be necessary to have religious instruction or covenant renewal services which appeal for the knowledge of God, for the whole community will know the Lord in the trust of a loyalty that cannot be broken. Fifth, this new covenant, quote, will rest upon divine forgiveness. And finally, sixth, this new covenant also contains an implicit hope for a new age, one in which all will be made right. More broadly, there are four themes that seem to repeat throughout the book of Jeremiah. First, foreign gods are nothing. Second, a critique of priests, scribes, and other prophets. Third, Babylon operating as God's instrument to punish the people for violating the covenant. And fourth, restoration and the new covenant. So in conclusion, what was Jeremiah's response to the theological emergency of the exile? As a way of underscoring God's control, Jeremiah reassured the Judeans that, one, the impending destruction and exile was their fault, two, they'd only be gone for a short time, and three, that this time would be a meaningful one. That is, by encouraging them to buy land in Babylon, Jeremiah is indicating to them that the destruction and exile will certainly be a catastrophe, but it's one that they will survive, and one that the covenant community will endure, especially because of the new covenant that we've discussed. Other writers like Ezekiel and the anonymous poet behind Isaiah chapters 40 to 55 have different responses to the exile, but Jeremiah's response seems to be, embrace it because it is what you deserve and it is what you will endure.